I want to welcome you to getting started with PostGIS and OpenStreetMap. Uh, my name is Lindsay Hooper. Um, I'm one of the Postgres conference organizers, and I'm so excited to be here on the line with you guys and with Ryan Lambert, uh, owner of Rustproof Labs. Um, a little bit on Ryan. He's been working with uh, GIS since 2011, and he got his start in PostGIS when on a quest to update a roadmap, he started using PostGIS, Postgres, and OpenStreetMap. He's been a contributor to OpenStreetMap projects since 2015 as well. Um, currently, he is working on a book on how to use PostGIS and OpenStreetMap together, and he's run open. Uh, excuse me, he's uh, run PostGIS on both large and small scales. Um, quick note for all of you: um, you'll notice at either the bottom or the top of your screen, it moves based on your browser. Um, a chat functionality. Um, feel free to ask any questions through that chat function. Um, they will mostly be uh, answered at the end of the training, but if there's something more pressing, um, you can go ahead, um, ask the question, and we will we'll try to get to it in the moment. Um, we're expecting to run between 50 minutes and an hour with you know another 10 minutes or so for questions. Um, one more thing, I've put everybody on mute to cut out the excess noise. Um, so if you need to contact either myself or Ryan, just do it through the chat function. Um, that is all on my housekeeping. And once again, we're so happy to have you here with us this afternoon or morning. Um, and I'm going to kick it off to Ryan now. So uh, enjoy and Ryan, take it away. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Lindsay, uh, for the introduction, and uh, thank you to PostgreSQL for hosting this uh, session and making this whole thing possible. Uh, thank you also to everyone who's joined us live today. Uh, it's great to have you here, and we are also recording this session uh, to make it available for future uh, for anyone who wasn't able to make it live today. Uh, I am Ryan Lambert. Uh, the best place you can find what I'm interested in is on our blog. Uh, I write about, uh, publish something about twice a month. Most of it focuses um, on post-GIS, post-Grace related technologies and that uh, ecosystem. I am also on Twitter if you want to follow me there. Uh, I talk about a lot of the same stuff. Ultimately, I really just love technology and data. I've been involved with technology all of my life. I was lucky to have a computer in the house growing up, um, and that really set the stage for me getting involved into a technology career later in life. Um, I love uh, PostGIS and maps in general, which was one of the great things about finding OpenStreetMap was just the cool technology mixed in with something that I've loved all my life since the paper copies. Uh, so this is the first of what is planned to be a six-part series, uh, and this is the only one of the six that I would call uh, non-technical and doesn't require some sort of background knowledge or the ability to be thrown into the deep end. The other five all get down into the nitty-gritty of the technology and the data and how to use them effectively together. Uh, but today we're going to keep it uh, pretty high level. Uh, we're going to go over a, quick, a high level view of the software, and that's PostGIS and Postgres. We're going to go over the OpenStreetMap project that represents the data that I'm using. And then I'm going to kind of show uh, some examples of why these tools together make such a great pair uh, in your toolkit. And then to end it off, I'll have a few uh, examples that illustrate how spatial data looks when you put it into a relational world of SQL. Uh, so all of this is made in, uh, possible because the whole ecosystem that we're using here is open. The software is open source. Postgres and PostGIS are open source software. Uh, OpenStreetMap is open data with the uh, um, addition of open source software as well. And this really gives uh, opens it up to anyone and everyone who wants to get involved with spatial analysis. Before I can really jump in and explore what PostGIS is, I need to set the stage a little bit with what a more traditional workflow uh, with spatial data might look like. When this is how I was introduced to, to GIS work and spatial work was we had really powerful, cool desktop software that connected to a whole bunch of data on our file server. 
a file server was required for us because our data was considered sensitive and we had a policy that said you can't have it on your local drive. So we had a file server that give, that allowed us to store all of our shape files and our attribute data and geo databases and all, all of those goodies. The downside of this traditional model um, is that you're, you're limited on what you can do and how you can scale. And to start with, the file server really is simple storage. It is nothing beyond your basic storage layer. It doesn't give you any other bonus or benefit or feature beyond storage. And one of the side effects of, of having uh, your data on a file server, uh, especially when working with a team, is you end up with a whole lot of versions of the truth. You have a copy and paste of each shape file for you know specific projects. You might make a project specific change in one shape file, and now you have multiple versions of the truth. And this just seems to be encouraged by the use of uh, of a file server. There's also limitations to how how granular you can make your security model. You, in general, file servers are granted permissions in wide swaths based on user groups or functional groups or permission, you know, permissions like that. But the granular access simply is not there for uh, row level data. And so that's one of the limitations if you work in an environment that has uh, security compliance uh, requirements. And then in the world today, uh, the desktop software is only one of the components. We have so much on the web. And if you want to put your data on the web, linking your desktop software to a file server probably isn't the right route. On the desktop side of that traditional model, we have some other limitations. Uh, my, my desktop is only so powerful. I have a quad core CPU and eight gig of RAM. You might have 16 or 32 gigabytes of RAM. You might have a faster processor with more cores, but really what you can put inside your general desktop is limited. It's also competing with the human that is using the desktop, namely me. I have 42 tabs in Chrome open at all times. I also probably have a virtual machine or two running, a few other pieces of software running. And so if you're relying on your desktop to provide the oomph, the processing power, it's simply just limited. And some of these processes that you will run with spatial analysis and spatial data are very heavy handed. They require a lot of power. Um, and when you when I do something like uh, batch geocoding a large set of data, I hit play, watch it for a couple minutes to make sure it doesn't crash right away. And then I had to go take a lunch for like two hours because it's going to take two or more hours to run some of these big processes. And I can't do anything else with that machine until it completes or I risk uh, interrupting the process and crashing it halfway. Another side effect of having all of your data on a file server and all of the processing in on your desktop software is all of that data has to go back and forth between the two. Uh, this is especially true if you are say, also updating data, not just reading data. You have to read the data off the file server. Your desktop software makes a change to it and it sends it back to the file server. And this might or might not be a big deal depending on your environment. In my case, I had uh, my desktop was uh, physically a quarter mile away from our data center on the same campus, one building, quarter mile away with all of the ethernet and switches in between, the latency was a killer to productivity for me. Uh, so having to send all of that data back and forth just to do simple processing uh, isn't the best use of the resources of the network bandwidth. So to overcome these problems, this is where we introduce PostGIS and a database server, in this case, Postgres. We feed our data into a single database, our single source of truth. We can consume all of our shape files, all of our CSV files, and honestly, those CSV files were probably in the database to start with. You only put them to CSV files to get them into your desktop software. Uh, so you have your uh, database that has all your data now, and we can move over a lot of that processing. A lot of the stuff that the desktop software previously had to do, our, our database server, our spatial database server, can handle all of that. We can do the joins between feature layers. You can do joins to attribute layers. You can do analytics all right in the database and connect to it from your desktop. 
This allows you to, you can still do spatial analysis from your desktop software, nothing limiting you there, but this allows you to choose which analysis you want to do on the desktop and which you want to offload to the server and really lets your desktop resources focus on, on uh, some more specific tasks. So PostGIS, uh, the official definition is up here. Uh, I like to just say that it adds superpowers to your existing uh, relational databases. So it really does. When you see the plethora of features and functions that are made available through PostGIS, whoa, that's a lot of cool stuff. Uh, one of the key words in the official definition up here is, uh, they call it a spatial database extender. And that's a key component here because PostGIS really does sit on the shoulders of Postgres. It is an extension that takes advantage of Postgres's innate ability to be customized. That was a goal from day one with Postgres was to make it easy to, to modify and to customize to your needs, to your workflow. And PostGIS took full advantage of that and continues to reap the benefits. So Postgres is a standard uh, relational database management system. It is open source. Um, if you hear the words open source and you think, uh-oh, I can't get support, that is false. There are plenty of organizations out there that will provide you enterprise level support for your Postgres databases. So just because you hear the words open source, don't think that it's going to be unsupported and a big headache because it is not. Um, and it's a really great community, both in the, uh, uh, the companies that support Postgres and just the wider open source community as a whole. Being a relational database, Postgres is going to take really, really good care of your data. It loves your data and it's going to make sure that it comes in and it keeps it very well protected. You get all of the wonderful benefits of a relational database. You get the easy SQL querying, you get to know that your data is, is consistent and reliable, you get transactions. If you need to scale up and have uh, more power so it runs faster, easy enough, you can scale horizontally or vertically. You can do streaming replication and set up uh, read-only nodes at different physical locations for fast read queries. Uh, load balancing is really the, the sky is the limit with what you can do with Postgres and the existing ecosystem. And all of this lives underneath the PostGIS functionality. I'm gonna focus in a little bit more on SQL querying. This is a really big benefit. This talk here, um, Lucas Eater uh, gave a talk about um, how Java programmers would have to program a task to get some data out versus how SQL programmers do the same thing. And he calls it a, he uses the terminology um, fourth generation language. In uh, uh, most uh, intro SQL courses, we refer to that as declarative programming language because you get to say, here's what I want. And you don't have to think about how it gets it. You just get to say, I want this data and the database goes out and it gives it back to you. And I like to relate this to a manager and an employee kind of relationship. A, a manager that has a good employee, they can say, you know, I really like you to get this task done for me and I need it fast. And if you have a good employee, they can go out and they can do that task if they're well trained and they can come back and then give you the result from the task. You as the manager do not have to necessarily ask, hey, how did you actually get that? And most times the manager shouldn't care how they got that. That's the way it is in SQL. You don't have to care about how you get it. I, I catch myself sometimes writing things in, in Python programming language and I start writing these weird loops and then after a few seconds, wait a minute, do it in SQL. Because SQL in, uh, in a nutshell is fast and productive not just on the server side and the technology side, but it's fast and productive for the human side. You don't have to go through a whole lot of brain damage to think about what you want and what, how to get it. You just have to decide what you want and let the database take care of the rest. And this is especially true with spatial data where uh, it can take advantage of, these, of the SQL syntax wonderfulness. So if you're familiar with uh, relational databases in general, but not so much with Postgres, uh, this is a, uh, are a few things um, that Postgres has that really uh, add some sugar to it. 
the H store and JSON at the top, I put that at the top because OpenStreetMap relies heavily on the H store data type. And that allows us, that's an extension, another extension in Postgres that allows us to store key value data that OpenStreetMap uses. And we use that in OpenStreetMap for historic reasons because JSON is a relatively new implementation in Postgres. It's getting really, really good with version 12, but for historic reasons, OpenStreetMap still uses uh, the HStore extension. Uh, row level security, going back to the file server and the broad swaths of permissions that you can grant, row level security in Postgres allows you to write SQL code and make that code a policy, a security policy, and apply that to your data. So your security policies can use the data itself to decide who can see the data. This allows you to really effectively manage who can see what, uh, such as if you had an employee's table with all their addresses. Maybe you only want the managers to be able to see the, their employees and, and not the employees of another manager. You can set up a row level security policy that allows that kind of a, uh, granularity of access. Really, really cool stuff if you have a, a security conscious environment. Materialized views and generated columns, these are both uh, ways that Postgres allows us to decide to uh, uh, pre-compute some values and save them to disk. Materialized views have been around for a long time and it's a lot like a regular uh, view, uh, SQL view, it just saves the, all of the data to disk. Um, generated columns are new in version 12, but it allows you to calculate a single, uh, single rows value based on other data in that column or functions. Um, really cool stuff that allow you to offload the expensive portions of your uh, spatial, spatial analysis. GIST indexes, um, that's what we would in this uh, uh, context call a spatial index. And that's really uh, what makes uh, all of the querying super fast. When you say, I want all the coffee shops within five miles, a GIST index can make that happen lightning speed. And Toast is there um, when you have your large data come in and spatial data, especially polygons, can get large quite quickly. So when your data size hits over eight kilobytes per row, it gets in, put into this oversized storage we call toast, and it automatically compresses it at the same time by default. So you get some uh, storage size benefits there as well. So just some cool extra benefits that Postgres brings to the table. And because PostGIS is an extension, it gets to stand on the shoulder of a giant. And by putting our data in the same database with our spatial processing, PostGIS, we get to cut out a whole lot of network back and forth and all of the latencies that are attached to that. We have our data and our processing in one place. It makes it super, super efficient. If you're familiar with uh, spatial analysis, you may be wondering, can PostGIS do what you need it to? And the answer is probably. Um, without knowing everything that you're doing, I can't say that in, in advance, but there's a good, really good chance that it can already do what you need. There are, um, and one of the fun things about talking about PostGIS is every time I show a specific way to do something, after the fact, someone will come up to me and say, why did you do it this way instead of that way? And my response is normally, huh. I didn't know that way existed. Let me go see if I'm doing it wrong. Because there's so much uh, power and so many options inside of PostGIS, it's hard to know everything and the best, and the, always the best method for your particular task. Um, in PostGIS, if you look at the function count that it installs, it's over 1,300 functions that get added to a database when you install the extension. One point to note is that with PostGIS 3, uh, the roster components of PostGIS have been split out. So in PostGIS 3, if you install just the, the vector base, the base vector uh, in portion, you'll have a smaller number than that. Anytime you put data into a system, one of the natural questions to ask is how do I get it out? With PostGIS, we have plenty, no shortage of tools to use. I've been talking about uh, the generic desktop software uh, so far. We have those are, those are really good options. They're on the heavy-handed side if you're a database person, though, so you might not want to be writing SQL queries in those. 
luckily we have some specific tools for the SQL lovers of us. Um, DBeaver and PG Admin 4 both have introduced spatial viewers in the past year or so. Uh, the spatial viewer allows you to write and draft your SQL query, your spatial SQL, in an easy editor, and then you can select some or all the data and visualize it in a map. It's really cool and really handy for those of us that need to write the queries but also want to visualize the data at the same time. And then for the developers, if you want to be, if you want to write something on a web layer or uh, in a programming language, uh, there are plenty of tools for uh, the variety of languages and frameworks of your choice. Uh, so you can probably get get in touch with the data. And of course, all of those uh, DBAs in Postgres land that love PSQL and swear by it, no problem, they can use it too. Again, with interoperability, um, there are plenty of formats that we can work with. Uh, if you have your spatial data in, in your database, you can wrap a query up with the, uh, as GeoJSON, and you'll get a GeoJSON data set. If you need a well-known text representation, there are multiple functions for that. Uh, shapefiles, no problem. Those are unfortunately uh, command line tools. I don't know of a way directly in SQL to do that, but there are ways to interface with shapefiles and all of those others. And one of the coolest I've seen lately is the ability to create a full-blown tile server in PostGIS. Uh, so MVT uh, is, stands for Mapbox Vector tile, uh, tile, I believe. And so this uh, post by Paul Ramsey goes through how, the steps that you can do, um, you can take in order to stand up a tile server in PostGIS. And then one more point I like to throw out there about PostGIS is we are not in any way restricted to Earth. In this talk today, in this series, we're talking OpenStreetMap, so that obviously puts us on Earth. Um, but if you're in other fields that have spatial kinds of data, PostGIS is a good option to consider. Um, I know the European Space Agency uh, gave a talk last March in New York about how they are using PostGIS and Greenplum. Um, an example, teaching data sets are a good example of when you might want to not bound something to Earth, because it's a whole lot easier to uh, use simple integers instead of real latitude and longitude values. So on to OpenStreetMap. So this is the data side of things as I'm seeing it. Um, I do need to throw out there though, OpenStreetMap is not limited to just data. The ecosystem of OpenStreetMap has its own software and interfaces, and there's a whole lot going on here. But for the purpose of this talk, I am focusing on OpenStreetMap simply as a data source. Uh, so if it, uh, just so you're aware that, I, that it is larger than what I am showing in this context, uh, that we are just concerned about the data for right now. So OpenStreetMap is a really cool project. It's been around for about 15 years, uh, started in the UK, and it represents a global data set. And this is one of the reasons I love uh, OpenStreetMap as one of my core base data sets, is because no matter where I want to work, uh, you know, geographically on data, I can at least get a starting point from OpenStreetMap. I know of a number of US specific sources for this and there's European sources for that. OpenStreetMap is a global data source. So that gives us a kind of a consistency, um, a consistent starting point that is nice to work with. It is a semi-structured data set. Uh, that goes back to the HStore data type I was talking about earlier. It's a, uh, they store the data in key value pairs. And if you're familiar with uh, Semi-structured data sets, you might be fully aware of the pain that this can cause on the reporting end of things, because with the flexibility uh, up front makes for more work later on. So the official definition of OpenStreetMap is up here. Um, I can never seem to remember this whole blurb when I'm talking to people on the street, so I just say it's Wikipedia for maps. That's about the most succinct way I can say it, and most people understand what Wikipedia is and the important concept that anyone can edit it, um, which makes you either happy or nervous, depending on, on where you stand on that topic. Um, but it's basically Wikipedia for maps. People around the world create accounts and sign in and make changes and make it a better place. 
OpenStreetMap is used very, very widely. Um, if you have seen a map that is made by anyone other than Google, it is most likely an OpenStreetMap source uh, for that map. Um, these are all over the place, and um, its popularity has continued to grow over the years, and this list of who's using it continues to grow, which is really encouraging to see that the community itself is growing. So OpenStreetMap itself, when you look at it in a browser, hey, it looks like a map. Um, this map has a few differences, though. Namely, in the top right corner, there's a sign up feature. Once you sign up, you can log in. And then you can uh, go in and edit the data. So if you don't like what you see in the map, you know it's wrong. There's been construction recently that you're aware of. You can edit and make it better. Um, when we're looking at a map like this, just think a little bit about how much data goes into making a map like this. How many data points does it take? Um, we have city names that show up, there's some forests, the Rocky Mountains are off to the west. There's a whole lot of information that has to be represented to draw a map like this. Every pixel that is here is here because of data in a database somewhere. That's pretty cool, really. At least to me, but I'm a nerd like that. Um, so OpenStreetMap has a whole lot of data. This is a very incomplete list of elements that you can find in OpenStreetMap. These are some of the more common um, elements that most people will find themselves using at least once or twice in their career. Um, but there are everything down to fire hydrants, trees, and crosswalks um, in OpenStreetMap. It is a unstructured, semi-structured, loosely regulated um, data set, so you can put in a whole lot of uh, random things that might not apply to everyone, but they apply to your locality. When the data goes into OpenStreetMap, it's, a, it's done in a key value pair. This is uh, an example of what a sidewalk might be uh, keyed as. The left side of each equal sign represents the key, and the right side of each equal sign represents the value. One thing to point out here is you might notice that some of the values can also be keys. In the case of footway, we have highway equals footway, so we're describing a kind of highway as a footway. And then we can further describe that footway as a specific type. In this case, it's a sidewalk. And then we can have other attributes that um, explain what type of, you know, the surface paved or maybe surface equals dirt um, can go in there. There's a lot of information out on the wiki. And if you're going to be consuming OpenStreetMap, you, if, if you're editing OpenStreetMap, you absolutely need to be here. If you're consuming OpenStreetMap, I highly recommend you get familiar with this wiki because it is going to help you much better understand the content of the data that you are working with. One of my favorite things about this wiki, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on here, is they have pictures. And while a picture for a sidewalk might not seem like it's really all that necessary, as you start looking through the diversity of the data and um, what they mean in different localities, these pictures can become extremely helpful. So the wiki, this is your data dictionary as far as OpenStreetMap coding goes. Uh, so keys, when you, when you take these keys and you turn them into more of a tabular data set that we're used to in, in database land, um, your keys then become your column headers. So in this case, we have our key highway has turned into a column header highway. We can see that there's footways and residentials and other classifications of highway. Also, I've, I've included a max speed column. Not every row will have a max speed. Even if they should have a max speed, they don't always get set. And that's just one of the nuances that you have to understand with this data is that it's going to be partially completed in, in various places. Going back to the volume of data. This is a 3D uh, map provided by this uh, f4map.com. They have this demo site. This is a fully um, navigatable 3D map using OpenStreetMap data. I'm not going to do a live demo of it during this because it takes a whole lot of oomph to run this in the browser, and I don't want to risk that. Uh, so I have this screenshot to kind of illustrate um, how much data is here. And so this is, we're looking at Coors Stadium 
Coors Field in downtown Denver. This is where the Colorado Rockies play. And to think about how many attributes and how many polygons and points go into making the 3D representation of a stadium is just mind boggling. And then, you know, you look at, we have flags up here on this ridge. We have all these trees around. There's uh, street lamps in the parking lots and stuff. This is all data in OpenStreetMap. There is a lot of information here that you can, that is at your fingertips and is freely available for you to take advantage of. Um, as the number of tags grows, they, they don't each get their own column in the database. As I've mentioned, we use the HStore uh, data type to shove all those key value pairs into a single column. In this case, I've ran a simple SQL query uh, where I'm filtering for the Coors field. That's the polygon we were just looking at at 3D. Um, and I'm grabbing it from a table and then I'm splitting out the keys, the key value pairs um, that, are all, that are in that file or in that column. And we can see down here the diversity. We have Ellie, that's elevation, 1585. Again, the wiki will tell you that this unit is supposed to be meters. Um, but so if you don't know what unit something is in, the wiki will help you out there. We have a website for where to find the information on MLB.com. We have a uh, Wikipedia name. We have roof color in hexadecimal. And color is a good thing to point out. Going back to the beginning of OpenStreetMap, remember it was started in the UK. So all of us uh, American English spellers will have to relearn how to spell a few words in order to work with OpenStreetMap. Um, but this here, this isn't even the full list of, of attributes because my screen is only sh that I can share is only so big. Um, there are so many attributes on th in this data that you can take advantage of um, in any type of analysis that you may be doing. So the spatial data we're talking about when we talk about OpenStreetMap data is called vector data. And I briefly mentioned that earlier about the split between vector data and roster data. But we are dealing with vector data. And in a nutshell, that's points, lines, polygons. Um, and then the multi versions of each of those. Um, but that, that's what says this is a point, this is a polygon, it's next to that line. Um, that's how the, the spatial information. But then as we've seen, we have this amazing wealth of semi structured um, pairs of data. So we have so much information that we can work with here. You can use OpenStreetMap for a whole lot of things. Um, as uh, was mentioned, I got started with, I just wanted a roads layer. The roads layer we had was horribly out of date. Um, it was horribly structured. I just wanted kind of a clean slate um, for, uh, for some ba base maps. And that was where I discovered OpenStreetMap and ultimately how I discovered Postgres and PostGIS. Uh, before that, I had worked in other databases, but this was my first exposure to um, PostGIS was when I wanted to create that roads layer. Um, the 3D rendering is really, really cool. That, that F4 map site, I rec if you have some time to kill, just go to somewhere you're interested in and zoom around and see what kind of 3D map you have in that area. Um, I'm hoping to see more and more development going into that, that side of uh, things. Um, and then I, analysis is really an open-ended box. What do, you, what do you mean by analysis? Well, it could be a whole lot of things. So there, there are so many things that this data set can be used for. Um, the, the, your imagination is really the limit. Now, when you want to get your hands on OpenStreetMap data, to use it, there are a number of ways, and the OSM Wiki has a whole page dedicated to this. You can get the whole planet as one big file. The um, compressed version of that in PBF format is over 40 gigabytes, and it grows enormously when you um, um, decompress it and load it. Um, on the, the OpenStreetMap page in the browser that I showed earlier, there is an export button that you can click for that you can get will allow you to grab small areas of data at a time. There's an API that you can interact with to get to get data out. Uh, and then there are other extract services such as Geofabric that they provide regional extracts. And that's actually the one that I have used the most. Um, 
I normally want larger areas of data, so the browser export really isn't an option. Um, and in all, in all reality, I kind of just wanted Colorado to start with, or I want all of the US. Yeah, I want a big region normally. And so that's why I go for these regional extracts. Um, Geofabrics service is really awesome. They, have, they update their data sets basically once a day. Um, they have regional exports for the entire world by large and small region alike. And um, PBF format is the most common that we'll uh, be working with. Their download page looks about like this. Uh, this is a small portion of their download page. I'm gonna take you over to the, the main site. And so we have our OpenStreetMap uh, data extract page here. The listing is down below with uh, multiple formats. So some files have more than one format, um, depending on what they've decided to do. I'm not sure how they make that decision. What I do know is every region has a PBF file, and that's why I've focused on using the PBF exclusively is because I know that it, I, wherever I want it for, I can get it. Um, North America, the PBF is 8.8 .8 gigabytes. Europe is 20.6 gigabytes. These are not tiny files by any, any stretch of the imagination. If I click on North America, and before I click on it, notice that the map on the right hand side will overlay with a, a red color where you have selected. So you know kind of what region that you're getting when you download something. If I click into North America, there's a few helpful bits here. First is up at the top, it'll tell you when it last was updated. So I can see now that this was updated 19 hours ago. If I was very concerned about getting the most recent data and I could wait five or six hours, I would, rec I would wait five or six hours to get the next update if that was my, my main goal. Scrolling down on the North America page, we get all of the um, additional subregions within North America. So if I wanted to download all of Canada, I can get all of Canada without having to load the rest of the US. Um, and these are roughly split by state uh, for the US. And then down at the bottom, there are um, some other special regions that allow you to, they combine a, a handful of states together based on uh, larger geographic regions. And so depending on where you, uh, what region of the world you're looking at, these regions and subregions will uh, reflect those, those areas. So those, those downloads, I'm, I'm coming back to download size. Uh, looking at um, North America, this screenshot actually shows 8.7 gigabytes. So it's grown 0.1 gig since I took this uh, shot a couple of weeks ago. Um, but the PBF size, um, PBFs are a highly compressed format. Um, there's a whole lot of information on the wiki about the format itself. My eyes kind of glazed over as I got into it. Uh, so feel free to um, dig in as much as you care to. Um, but the key detail here is the compression. The compression ratio of PBF is 30 to 50% smaller final size than your other comparable GZIP or other compression formats. So that 8.8 .8 gigabytes for, um, for the North America will be about 50% larger if you download another format of compression size. And then once you load, decompress it and load it into PostGIS, the data size is gonna grow exponentially because of how PostGIS stores the data versus how the PBF format works. So just something to be aware of on those file sizes that those are really, really highly compressed files. So we have, once we've decided on a data source and we have our data in uh, the, the downloaded, we need to get it into our PostGIS database. And this is uh, done with a tool called OSM to PGSQL. This is another tool that, to the best of my knowledge, is only offered in a command line option. Um, so you'll just have to run with command line and learn the, the switches. The, Details behind this slide make up the entire content of the next uh, session in this uh, series. Loading data from the PBF format to PostGIS is quite a, it's not that difficult, but it takes a, there's a bunch of steps you just have to get right. Um, and it's a slow enough process that when you get it wrong, it takes a while for you to get those errors so you can restart. Um, if you are using OSM to PGSQL, please, it is in your best interest to use the latest and greatest version. 
Um, the Ubuntu packaged versions are unfortunately quite a bit out of date, and this project has been quite a bit quite active in the last year. Uh, 1.0 was released only a few months ago, and we're already up to 1.2. This latest version fixed a memory a memory bug that. Uh, required a whole lot of RAM to load a little tiny bit of data. So this, uh, you definitely want to be using the latest version of OSM to PGSQL. And in a nutshell, the, the load process um, starts with your PBF file. Um, it, it's represented as this planet dump. And OSM to PGSQL decompresses it, parses it out, and loads all the data into your post GIS tables as necessary. So OSM to PGSQL really is the gateway between your source OSM data and your target post GIS uh, server. And as I mentioned earlier, this is a uh, kind of a long running process. Uh, this is from a blog post. I'm not going to go into all, all of the detail about the individual rigs or what this means beyond um, rig D the orange line uh, was a DigitalOcean droplet, one of the, their new memory optimized droplets with 16 cores and 128 gigabytes of RAM. With that in mind, the North America load, which is almost nine gigabytes, takes well over an hour, getting close to an hour and a half. Uh, that's the orange line in the middle. The far right orange line loading Europe, you can see that even that pretty powerful server takes almost five hours to load Europe uh, in full. And that's just getting the data in. It's really still kind of raw, not fully ready to go yet. Um, that's just getting the data in. So it is a slow running process. It is a lot of data. So be aware with, of that. So now why? Why use these technologies and this data? I kind of feel like the whole talk so far has been covering the why, but that's my nerdy technical side um, seeing it. So a few more reasons. I think the most important, and this is true with pretty much all open source projects, is you can make it better. And this is a really big deal. I, uh, a while ago, found a bug in and uh, how Post Postgres handled XML data, um, and it Ultimately, there was a long, long known workaround to the side effect of this bug. But because there was a workaround, it really wasn't considered a critical bug to fix. I got tired of, of this workaround one day and I decided to dig in to see what I could do to make this better. Um, and it turns out I found a bug, I reported it, and six months later it was fixed in production. If you have the latest and greatest version of Postgres, you never have to do this workaround ever again. Um, I had a very tiny hand in helping fix that, but you know it's what it's just really cool to be able to submit a bug and six months later it's in production, it's fixed. On the OpenStreetMap side of things, if you don't like the data, you can make it better. Uh, this is something I do on a regular basis. I've, I've made a, a goal this year to contribute more to OpenStreetMap. And other than the beautiful months of summer, I did a pretty good job. Turns out I like to go play in summer and I, I don't do very much mapping then. Um, but you can make contributions uh, based on your local knowledge to make your data sets better. A good visual uh, representation of this is this is an animation I developed after hosting a mapping party in uh, here in Golden a few years ago. The animation shows the OpenStreetMap data sets over time and how the data filled in. And you can go from a really blank slate and in a relatively short amount of time and less than a dozen people, we filled in the bulk of the, the core information around our, our local community. So this is a, a visual uh, re representation of how you can contribute and complete, make your data sets more complete. Another good reason, it's the price is right. Uh, there is no um, entry fee to get into this club. You, you can just start playing today. You don't have to pay out, shell out big bucks and sign contracts and do a whole lot of stuff to get to use it. It's just there and available. Uh, this is a big deal, especially for small organizations, small businesses, local governments, etc. 
And um, because of the price being so low, there are only a handful of strings attached. The only real one that I can think of is that if you produce results with OpenStreetMap, give credit where credit is due, give credit to the, the uh, data set that made it possible to, to produce the final results. Uh, this isn't that hard to do, and you can put it on your maps fairly unobtrusively. Um, and most people expect to see a copyright somewhere anyway. Another example of it's uh, easy to use is the Postgres license. The Postgres license is simple enough. I can fit it here on a screen during the slideshow. Um, the simplicity of a, of, a con of a license might not be a, seem like such a big deal, but you don't need a team of lawyers to do an audit every now and then to see if you're in compliance, because I can pretty much guarantee you, you are. It's easy to use, there's little friction, uh, these are all good reasons to use the systems. Another reason to use it, and this is on a more personal note for me, is you can use it for anything you want at any time, and it's there, and it's ready. Uh, this blog post outlines a fire that happened uh, very close to our house not too long ago here in Golden on South Table Mountain. And so the aftermath uh, looked like this. This was about three days after the fire had happened. Um, but one day my wife and I were both driving home at the same time and we both saw the same plume of smoke coming over the, uh, the top of the mountain that we live right next to. And we realized we've never talked about evacuation plans. <laughs> kind of a good deal. We, this is also the moment we realized we have two cats but only one cat carrier. So while all this is going on and we're having these conversations, we're watching the local news helicopters fly overhead us and on our TV we have the local news playing and I start making notes of where they're, what, what I'm seeing from the helicopter feed. And before the, the night was over, I had a map of what, what the areas that had most likely burned. And in the end result was I have a map of what actually did burn. I went up and surveyed the whole area. Um, but having this open street map data, I had all of these data points that represent uh, landmarks that I, can, I could uh, uh, correlate between what I was seeing in the aerial photography, the aerial video, versus what I know on the ground and what I can see in open street map. And if open street map wasn't there and post GIS didn't exist. This is the kind of project that I could never have done and I would have never known exactly how far, how close the fire got to our house. It was pretty, it was just over a mile. Um, so that was a, a really cool project. Um, also to illustrate on the Northwest of this map, this is the Coors Brewery. That's a pretty valuable piece of property as far as Golden is concerned. We also have a country club over here that this fire was getting close to. The wind had come up from the west and was pushing it up on the ridge and that was getting ready to push it down the ridge into the country club. And had the wind switched to come from the north, this is all residences and mixed government and um, co commerce, all of that. So there's fire in the middle of a heavy, heavily populated area. I was able to quickly kind of see what is nearby, what's impacted and where are we in relation to that. Another big benefit, I love this one. This is one of the, my best selling points of Postgres in general, is you can run it on anything. Whatever hardware you already have, whatever OS you're already running, you can probably run Postgres on it. Um, if you have heavy, powerful iron servers that you want to put it on, cool, it'll be fine. You want to run it on a Raspberry Pi? That's also cool. It'll run fine. You just have to have a little bit more patience because it's not going to be quite as fast, but it will run. So into some examples. Here we're going to look at um, so how spatial data looks in a relational world. Uh, pretty standard, simple SQL query. We have um, the first line is uh, says we want these columns. The second line says get it from this table, and the third line is our filter that says we only want to look at two uh, boundaries. We want to look at Golden and we want to look at Denver. Fairly simple. This is a straight up, you know, standard relational query. I wrapped it up here in a little bit of Python code so I could execute it and show you the results. I can run it and lo and behold, I get a little table. Tabular results, really nothing interesting here, but it's just to illustrate the query. 
Now to take this another step, we want to make it spatial enable. We can do this. Um, I've added a single column into my SQL query uh, called way. This is the column that my geometry data is stored in, my spatial data. And by using adding this way data into my result set, I can now use the GeoPandas uh, tool and pull in pull this data in as a geo data frame from PostGIS. And then I can plot it on a map. So if I run this, it'll run pretty quickly and right away I get a, a little square with a couple polygons. The one on the left, the small polygon on the left is uh, golden. The larger one on the right is the city and county of Denver. So this is not a very exciting uh, spatial query, but it is a spatial query nonetheless. Now, this is where things really get interesting. This is where things get fun. Spatial joins um, are one of the key components of spatial SQL. Just like any you know, regular joins are a key component of any relational database, the ability to join between tables is pretty critical. This allows us to do those joins based on where they are in space. In this case, I'm now pulling from two tables. I have my boundary polygon still that has my city. Oops. I have aliased it as city. We also, and we're joining to a layer called natural point. And this has some natural elements in the uh, world around us. And I'm, I'm putting in there that I want to find just the trees. More critically is the ST contains. This is the part that is post GIS. This is what allows us to do the spatial join. We're looking for n.way, that's our trees layer. We're looking for trees that are inside our city. So with this, Again, I'm wrapping it up in uh, Python so I can run it. I can run this and now we get a series of points back. This represents all the trees that are mapped in the city of Golden. If I wanna change this and instead of, maybe I don't want Golden, maybe I want Lakewood. I can change that query, simple filter. I get a completely different set of trees back based on where they are in space. And this is the basic setup of what makes spatial query so awesome. And just uh, for fun to prove that uh, this uh, does run very nicely on a Raspberry Pi, this is uh, what I have been running my queries against is Postgres running on Raspberry Pi with PostGIS 2.5. Uh, so even for live demo for small data sets, uh, Raspberry Pi is sufficient to run um, and able to run spatial SQL for us.